Hey folks, I'm Hunor, and in this course we are going to cover another JavaScript game with HTML canvas. The game itself is very simple. We control an air balloon that flies above a forest. By holding the mouse down, the balloon will rise, and after releasing the mouse, it will slowly descend. The only thing you have to watch out for is to not hit any trees, because then the game will end. In this tutorial, first we go through in detail how to draw a balloon with HTML canvas. Then, as a second example, we will see how to draw trees based on randomly generated properties. Then we talk about positioning these elements on the canvas and build up our game. We add some game logic, event handling and animation to fly the balloon. And finally, we add a very basic hit detection that will stop the game once the balloon crashed into a tree. So let's get into it. Let's start with drawing. We are going to draw an air balloon and a tree on the canvas. The air balloon is static, there is no variation there, but the tree can come in different variations. We are going to see how to generate a few random parameters for a tree, then how to draw it based on these properties. But let's start with the balloon first. At the beginning of this tutorial, we skip a few initialization steps. We jump straight into the drawing parts and assume we already have a canvas. Then later on, when we will assemble the whole scene, we go back and set things up. The coordinate system of a canvas grows to the right and downwards. At first, we are going to place our balloon to the origin, and later we are going to see how to move it to a different position. So how does drawing work? Let's write a function that draws the balloon. We start with the cart. The cart is only two rectangles. We set a fill color as a hex value, then draw a rectangle by setting its top left coordinate and its width and height. Then we draw a bigger rectangle with a different color below it. We always set the color and other parameters before the drawing commands. Once something is on the canvas, we can't change it. It's like with a real painting. We can draw on top of existing shapes we can even clear parts of the canvas, but once something is on the canvas, we can't change it. So we want to make sure that before we execute a fill or stroke command that draws something on the canvas, we already have set up every necessary parameter. Now let's move on to the cables holding the cart and the balloon itself. HTML canvas doesn't come with too many different shapes. Everything that's not a rectangle, we have to draw line by line as a path. Then once we define the path, we can do two things with it. We can either fill the path and end up with a shape, or draw the path itself and end up with a stroke. We have examples for both of them here. For the cables, we are going to use the stroke command once we finish the path. So we set up a stroke color here and a stroke width and begin the path. We build up this path line by line. First we move to the starting coordinate then draw a line with the line2 command. This draws a line from the coordinate set by the move2 command to the coordinate set by the line2 command. Path commands always continue the previous path segment. Then we move again to continue with the other cable. We are still in the same path because all the properties we set for the left cable are true for the right cable as well. They have the same color and line width. We could break this down into two different paths, but it's not necessary. Then with another line2 command, we define another line segment. Then we finish with the stroke command that draws the two lines. Then let's move on to the interesting part, drawing the balloon. This is another path that we are going to fill. We set the fill color, then we start a new path and move to the starting position. Then we draw a quadratic Bezier curve. This is a line that is bending towards a point. The last two parameters of this command set the end of the path segment and the first two set a control point. A control point is a coordinate to which the line is bending to. Initially, the curve is moving towards this control point and when it arrives at the end point, it also comes from the direction of the control point. You might be wondering at this point, how do we know all these coordinates? 
Well, this requires a bit of imagination. You can start with pen and paper to do a sketch and estimate the coordinates, but mostly I just make a guess, then refine these values till it looks good on the screen. For more complicated shapes, you can break them down into easier ones and then assemble them. But back to our balloon. We continue with an arc. There's also an arc2 command where we set the end coordinate of our arc, but that's a rather complex method. Luckily, there's also an arc command that only looks bad, but it's rather simple. We start with setting the center coordinate, then setting the radius of the arc to 80 pixels. Then the next two parameters define the angle of the starting and ending points. We start with 180 degrees and end with 0 degrees. We have to set these values in radians though. 180 degrees in radians equals the value of pi, so we use math.pi, and 0 degrees is also 0 in radians. Then the last parameter is telling whether the arc should go counterclockwise or not. This is not the case, the arc goes clockwise, so this value is false. Then we have another quadratic Bezier curve. This is the mirror of the other side, but the difference is not only that the values of the x-dimension are in the opposite. The values are also different here because this curve goes in the other direction, from top to bottom. Remember the path segments always continue the previous segment. Then with the close path command we close the path. And finally with the last line we fill the path. And there we go, we have a balloon. Now let's move on to drawing trees. Trees come in different variations and they seem to be rather complex. But under the hood they are assembled from a simple path and a bunch of circles. We are going to start with drawing the trunk, then we add 7 circles. These circles have different sizes and different positions, and when they are overlapping they look like a crown of a tree. Drawing a tree will have two parts. First we generate the metadata of each tree and store it in an array. This metadata will contain randomly generated values like the height of the tree and its color. Then we have a draw function that draws the tree on the canvas. The reason we separate these two is that we are going to call the draw trees function with every animation cycle, and we want to make sure that it draws the same trees every time. So we can generate random values in the draw function, we have to store them first. So let's look into the generate tree function. Each time this function is called, it pushes a new tree metadata into a global array called trees. It generates a random height, size for each circle in the crown, and a random color. Each of these random values is generated with the method random function that returns a value between 0 and 1. Let's see the height generation for instance. The height comes up from a base height which is 60 and a random number between 0 and 80. So the height value will end up somewhere between 60 and 140 pixels. The same happens with the circle sizes. The color selection is a bit different, because here we have to select a wall number, so we also use the method floor to end up with either 0, 1 or 2. Once we generated all these values, we push it as an object to the trees array. Then on the other side of things, in the draw trees function, we go through this array and draw the trees. We are going to draw the tree above the origin of the coordinate system again. We start with drawing the trunk. The trunk is a path again, so we begin a path and move to the starting position. Then we have another quadratic Bezier curve. This curve is symmetric, so it might be easier to understand it. The coordinates of this curve though depend on the height we generated earlier. The tree's trunk will be as high as the value we generated, and the control point will be halfway. Then we continue with a straight line to the opposite side, still maintaining the height set by metadata. And then go down with another quadratic Bezier curve, close the path and fill it. Now let's move on with the crown. The crown will consist of circles, and unfortunately we do not have a circle command. 
Luckily, we just learned how to draw an arc. So let's create a utility function first that draws a circle with a given center and a given radius. These arcs will go from 0 degrees to 360 degrees and each circle will be a separate path. We want each circle as a separate path because otherwise the draw command would try to connect them and we don't want that. What we don't see in this utility function though is the color. It's enough to set it once at the draw trees function and because we won't change it between drawing the circles, all of them will use the same color. So back in the draw trees function, we call this function seven times. Each drawn circle will have a different center position and their radius is coming from the metadata. And as we finish drawing, we have a nice looking tree. We learned how to draw an air balloon and how to draw trees based on metadata. But if we would call these functions after each other, we would end up with overlapping drawings. Of course we want them to be aligned nicely after each other. So let's see how can we position these shapes. To do so, we go back in time and set up our canvas. It all starts in HTML. We have a canvas element. Be aware that the canvas element, despite usually not having any content, should have a separate closing tag. Otherwise, the browsers might render something you don't want. Then we get this element in JavaScript by ID and set its size to fill the whole browser window. Then we get the drawing context. This returns the CTX variable that we used all along to draw things on the canvas. By default, the origin of the canvas coordinate system is at the top left corner of the canvas element. So if we would call the draw balloon function, then it would render a balloon outside of the visible area. We need to transform the coordinate system. So instead of calling the draw balloon function directly, we call a draw function first. This will be the main drawing function that draws everything on the scene. Before we get to it, let's create an imaginary main area in the middle of the screen. This is not something that will be visible on the screen, but our coordinate system will relate to it. Given that it has a size, we can calculate the horizontal and vertical padding around it. Then the draw function, first we are going to clear the whole canvas. In the beginning it's empty, but the draw function will be called at every animation cycle, so we want to start with a clean slate. Then we are going to translate the coordinate system with the translate command. We shift it horizontally by the horizontal padding and vertically by the vertical padding and the height of the main area. Now if we call the draw balloon function, then the balloon will end up at the correct position. But we need to add a few more steps. To see why, let's see what happens the second time this function is called. First, it clears the canvas. So far good. But then it moves the coordinate system again. The translate command is accumulative. If we call it twice, it will move twice and the second time we try to draw the balloon, it will be already out of the picture. To avoid that, after drawing, we want to reset the transformation with the restore command. The restore command will reset transformations, colors and other settings to the most recently saved canvas state. This means that restore always comes in pair with save. And this is a common pattern. Usually, before calling the translate command, we save the canvas state, and once we finish drawing, we restore it. We position the air balloon, so now let's position the trees. First, let's generate a position for each of them in the metadata. Here you can see the generate trees function again. Most of these are the same as before, but now we extend it with a new x position coordinate. First, we define two new constants. One for the minimum gap between the two trees that follow each other, and one for the maximum gap between them. Then we generate an x-coordinate with a ternary expression. The value will depend on the length of the tree's array. If the tree's array is empty, and the tree that we are just about to add will be the first one in the array, then it's simple. Then we set the first tree's position to 400. Then for every other tree, we add together the previous tree's position and the random number between 50 and 600. Now let's see how will the drawing happen. 
we start in the draw function with a clear canvas. Then we translate our coordinate system to match our main area. Then we draw the balloon. So far everything is the same as before. But then we are also going to call the draw trees function. This function is slightly modified now. The only difference is that it will also translate the coordinate system for each tree. This will add a second transformation on top of the main one in the draw function. It will jump to the tree's position, draw the tree, then restore the second transformation. Then it will move to the second tree's position, draw that one as well, then jump back again. And so on for every tree. Then once the draw trees function has finished, back in the draw function we restore the first transformation as well. This way we can build up our scene. We can also add the background and draw the ground, but I'm not going to the details with that now. Instead of that, let's turn this static image into a game. Let's add event handling and animation. Once we hold down the mouse, the balloon should rise and move forward, and once we release the mouse, it should slowly decline. We also want to have a smooth animation curve and not a boxy one. We achieve this by not changing the balloon's position directly, but changing its velocity. Let's see how that works. Initially, gravity is pulling the balloon down. Then as we hold down the mouse, we build up a force pushing the balloon in the opposite direction. Until this force is smaller than gravity, the balloon will stay on the ground. It takes a few milliseconds after pressing down the mouse till the balloon starts to rise. But once the pushing force becomes bigger, the balloon starts to rise. As you hold down the mouse, this force becomes bigger, the balloon gets faster as the balloon gains velocity. And even after you release the mouse, this velocity will still move the balloon upwards for a while. Then gravity flips the movement to the other direction again, and the balloon starts to decrease at an increasing pace. So that's the behavior we want to achieve. To realize this, let's go back to the foundations again, and let's define a few global variables that define the game state. We are going to keep track of the balloon's x and y positions. We also need to know if the mouse is down or not. When the mouse is down, we heat the balloon and the warm air will raise it. Then we need to keep track of the vertical and horizontal velocities of the balloon. We also have the trees array we saw earlier. And finally, we have another boolean flag indicating whether the game has started or not. Then let's also define a reset function that we can use both to initialize the game state and to reset it. Here we set the initial values, generate 10 trees and draw the initial scene. Once we initialize the game, let's add event handling. On the mouse down event, we set the heating flag to true and on the mouse up event, we set it back to false. At the mouse down event, we also start the animation with request animation frame. We want to make sure that this happens only once though, as we don't want to trigger the animation twice. So we only do this if the game hasn't started yet, and then immediately set the game started flag to true. Now let's see this animate function that is responsible for the animation. This function will handle everything in motion, and it ends with requesting another animation frame. This way we end up running this function 60 times every second. First we define two constant. This to define by how much should the velocity increase while the balloon is rising and by how much it should decrease when the balloon is descending. Remember this function is running 60 times every second, so these values should be small. Then we change the vertical velocity by these values. While heating we should push the velocity upwards and while cooling we should decrease it. But as the coordinate system grows downwards, all these values are upside down. I also set a lower limit for the velocity, so while descending the balloon never gets too fast. After adjusting the velocity, we change the balloon's actual position by it. We also set a limit here, because we don't want the balloon to go underground, so once it reaches the ground, we stop it. If the balloon is in the air though, we also move it forward by the horizontal velocity. This value is constant, we set it earlier in the reset function. Now another thing we want here to do is making sure that we never run out of trees. 
Initially, we only generated 10 trees. That's good for a while, but as the balloon moves forward, soon it flies over them. So here we check if the first tree moved off screen, and if so, then we remove it and generate another one. And finally, with every animation cycle, we redraw the wall scene. The draw function also needs some adjustments. It should take into consideration our new balloon position. We change two things. In the draw balloon function, we add another translate command. Of course, here we also save the context before the transformation, then restore it after we draw the balloon. This will move our balloon to its position, but soon it will move it outside of the picture. We need to adjust our main translate command as well to balance the movement of the balloon. So in the draw function at the main translate command, we move the wall scene. We move the wall scene by the balloon's X position, but into the opposite direction to balance its movement. This way it will appear that the balloon only moves up and down, but everything else moves to the left. Now that we added event handling and animation, we can control the balloon. But what happens if the balloon crashes into a tree? As a final step, let's add hit detection. In the animate function, after drawing the scene, but before requesting the next animation frame, we check if the balloon hit a tree. If it did, then we return from this function. Returning from the function at this point means that it will never reach the last line. And if we don't request another animation frame, the animation stops and the game ultimately ends. Now how does this hit detection function look like? First, we get the coordinates of the three points we are going to test. These will be the bottom left corner of the cart, the bottom right corner, and the top right corner of the cart. We only test these three points on the balloon because most probably these points will get a hit first. Then we go through each tree. For each of them, we get the coordinates of the first five circles that make up the crown of the tree. We only check the first five because the last two are on the bottom right side of the tree and as the balloon moves to the right, it's unlikely that they will have a hit. Then we check if a circle is closer to any of the balloon corners than the radius of the circle. We calculate the distance using the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem says that the distance between two points is the square root of the sum of the vertical and horizontal distances squares. Using this, we can decide if a point is within a tree crown circle or not. If so, we return true and the animation will stop. Of course, we do the same test with all five circles and if the card is too close to any of them, the game will stop. So those were the main parts of the game. There are some features I didn't cover in this tutorial. We didn't draw a background for our scene and we didn't add logic for fuel consumption to make it challenging. You can find these though in the CodePen version of this game. So if you need some further inspiration or you want to go through the code we talked about in more detail, then you can find the whole source code on CodePen. The link is below in the description. If you want to play around with the code, you can find a fork button at the bottom right corner that will make a copy of the game for you. This version you can change as you like and your changes will be saved to your account. If you come up with a better version, please share it in the comments below. Thank you for watching this tutorial. If you like this course, please subscribe and don't forget to check out my earlier tutorials as well. Let me know what you would like to learn next and if you have any feedback in the comments below. See you at the next one.